Welcome to CivilNet. My guest today is businessman and technology developer Levon Toros. Mr. Toros, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, we invited you here today. Um, there's an exciting new product that's being developed in Armenia by a group of scientists at Yerevan State University, led by Professor Samvel Gevorkian. Yes. Uh, it is a device, uh, a sensor, which is unprecedented in the field because it's an early warning detection system. Uh, now, please explain to us what this really means. What is this sensor and why is it different? Why is it special? It's special in many ways. In the world of sensors, there are lots of seismic sensors and non-seismic sensors that do detection, early warning detection and they perform well and they're in the industry all over the world. This sensor is uniquely different. It is a lot more sensitive, but at the same time, it's got a lots of bandwidth. That means smartness that I'll explain later on. Yes, Professor Gavorkian is the inventor of a new seismic sensor that is unprecedented, that's correct, and it can apply to many different market segments. Early warning security systems for border and intruder detections, illegal intruder detections, also in medical fields, because it's a super sensitive sensor for body functional detections. Also, other industrial fields, such as oil and gas, that we will not have a chance to talk about. But it is. Professor Gavorkian and I are working together to create a business and provide sensor systems doing many functional things, including security of borders. So the sensor that they have developed, this group of scientists, um, when you said seismic sensor, my first reaction is earthquake detection. So it can also be applied to that? It or will be a wonderful earthquake sensor because it's many times more sensitive than the best seismic sensor in the world. A seismic event like an earthquake is huge movements. For us, human footsteps are like earthquake. We can sense people's walk. That's how sensitive it is. It could technically also be applied to home security systems as well, yes. obviously. Yes, of course. Um, okay, so you have a device, a, a sensor that has many different applications. Mm -hmm. uh, from the business perspective, that's where you come in, where you help take this prototype and market it for a global market, um, produce it, which we can talk about later about cost efficiency and all of that. Um, from a business perspective, how important is it to have one, to, to, to concentrate on one application of this particular device as opposed to developing the many different applications it could potentially have? In marketing world, you go where the demand is. In today's world, there are lots of borders with troubles. Conflicts. Lots of conflicts, even if there are no conflicts. For, that, for example, for decades in USA, there is a porosity of the border between Mexico and USA. And the government and Homeland Security have been trying to resolve the problem for decades, 40 years, maybe 50 years, not successfully. Even many tech still, the intruders do the intrusion, underground or overground. Right, because so even the most primitive things have been talked about, building a wall and all of that, right? Don't work. So uh, the, the smart guys who want to intrude, they go underground with tunnels. And so the advantage of our sensor is nobody can hide by digging tunnels. Because it could sense... It can sense movements. Movement. It can sense a movement of one nanometer, a movement of one nanometer. Uh, what, what is a nanometer? One nanometer is one billionth of a meter. In other words, divide one mm -hmm. by one with nine zeros. It's a very small movement. Most sensors have tough time measuring one nanometer resolution. Besides, the frequency response, which we'll explain later on, I hope the professor will, is very wide band. So one nanometer resolution, 
with very large bandwidth gives you the intelligence to be able to say if that movement was caused by human, by nature, or whatever. It can recognize. Okay, so um, getting back to the sensor, what is the one area that you have decided, along with uh, Professor Gaborkian, to, to develop? What application are you currently working on? Currently, we have developed and we have the prototype hardware to demonstrate border security. We lay our sensors just like others at any given border, any border scenario, and we create a corridor, a wide corridor for intrusion detection. If somebody was trying to cross the border and didn't want to be noticed, will be noticed will be noticed far before they come close to the border, giving the security people the advantage of time, much earlier warning system than the existing systems in the world. But what if it was uh, a dog or a fox crossing? Dogs and uh, animals, wild animals cross the borders all the time sure. and cause a lot of false alarm at this time. As a matter of fact, 60% is reported at the U.S.-Mexico border, which we are happy to resolve because the footsteps and the characteristics of a human footstep is quite different than animals. Okay. And given the large bandwidth we have, the frequency response, they are actually different from each other when we measured. If they are different from each other that we measured, it could be easily signal processed to differentiate automatically. So this sensor, for layman terms, could basically detect the difference between a four-legged animal and a two-legged human? Yes. Or even type of animal, perhaps? Or Yes. We can develop differentiating and classifying different kind of footsteps. Human, differentiate that from a car, from animals. My next question, right. From, for example, a, a tracked vehicle will have quite different signature because it beats the ground with the tracks than a wheeled vehicle. And of course the humans are very much different. So we can classify the movement types on the ground and by classifying you can put it in the memory of a computer and automatically recognize it and that's called artificial intelligence. So we can use these sensors to provide artificial intelligence to differentiate intruders. Okay, I want to get into the nuts and bolts, if we may. Let's take Armenia and uh, Gharapag and Azerbaijan, the line of contact. Um, I don't know how far from the actual line of contact military posts are positioned, but um, let's say it's 100, 200, 300 meters away. Um, what we can see with our naked eye, we, we can see movement, right? This sensor goes beyond that, I'm assuming. Yes, it obviously. does. Obviously. Uh, what is the range, and what is the range of existing sensors in the market today? Very good question. The state-of-art sensors in the world today that are in actually hardware and systems and are used in the borders, many places, the detection corridor mm -hmm. is plus or minus 30 meters, a radius of 30 meters. So it's a corridor of 60 meters wide. 60 meters wide is what they use with a lot of false alarm. That's what it is today. Our sensor could reduce a false alarm near zero, which is very important, but the corridor will be like 500 meters. Wow. So you could lay that corridor and give you nine to one advantage. So if today an intruder could pass the corridor and be on the screen like one minute with our sensor, he will be visible for nine minutes. It gives you reaction time, gives you location way early. So it's a really early warning intrusion detection system. So it, it could technically, hypothetically, prevent casualties on the border. Yes, it does. Absolutely does. The record shows because of the confusion caused by false alarm and because they do not differentiate animals from humans, has happened, and it's recorded, that two security guards have gone to one location and shot each other. And, and that confusion does happen. As a matter of fact, the users are complaining about the false alarm and the fact that 
is the old technology, the days of technology, I call old in comparison to new ones, do not really service for 100% security. They could be a supplementary um, system to actual other systems or human soldiers uh, on the border. The sensor, as we said, could eliminate, if not 100%, but significantly decrease human casualties on the border. Uh, it, it also would contribute to being not only a supplementary device, but actually could take the place of many other systems, whether the actual uh, soldiers or other kinds of systems. Have you, I mean, maybe this is a ridiculous question. I'm sure you've tested it, but what have been the test results? Is it 100% all the time getting its mark? Uh, very good question. We have tested our system side by side on the same ground with the best systems in the world and the best systems in the world are American systems at the border. We, by testing it side by side, the empirical results, results are nine to one. In other words, our corridors are like 500 meters long and the, the best system tested is only 60 meters at best. <coughs> yes, that happens all the time. The variable is the ground. If the ground is rocky, detections are bigger, the corridors are bigger. If the ground is sandy, mm -hmm. it's much less. It's for both systems. In other words, they're comparatively, they go bigger corridors and smaller corridors. Yes? And ha do you actually go and you, you plant the device underground? And, yes. And, and I, I'm thinking about how does it work? What, what frequency? Do, does it require batteries? How does it actually work? The present systems in the market require batteries and therefore Several times a year, they have to go change the batteries. These Putting the, themselves in harm's way, I assume. If it's a war zone, sure. absolutely correct. If it's not a war zone, it's just logistics nightmare. They gotta go change the batteries uh, several times. And, and to do that, they either have to dig and replace back, bury them. Our sensors do not use batteries. Okay. We, we use other methods of providing energy to them. And there are also some trade secrets there. Okay. Once you put our sensors in the ground, you bury them and forget about it. How you transfer energy to them is several different ways. We use solar systems, for example, and those are a kilometer or two kilometers away, not in harm's way, and you don't have to go to do change for each sensor. It's once changed for a kilometer. So it has logistics improvements for the user. Yes, what we have today, we're ready to demonstrate at the border. As a matter of fact, the uh, two very interested people in Armenia who have approached us, or we have approached them, the first is the Ministry of Defense. Uh, Seyran Ohanyan is very aware of this and has actually helped by providing test facilities, firing ranges, and people and soldiers to test the, and measure the results I've mentioned to you. The second person who are working together to generate a proposal is the, uh, the head of science committee, state science committee, mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Uh, Samvel Harutunyan. Mm -hmm. He has been, uh, he's very knowledgeable about this technology and has provided a competition for us, an opportunity for us to actually win to develop a vectorial sensors that we are doing now. Uh, vectorial sensors are three-dimensional sensors. They measure movements in each direction on a surface out of ground and also down into the ground. So it's a wonderful development. These two uh, gentlemen and uh, people who work for them are very aware. We're trying to develop a proposal in development right now in the preparation to actually implement one kilometer of border so that the users can test and evaluate and see it for themselves. This is in process now. You know, this is a, this is a world that, or, or an area that's fascinating for me. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go back to the basics again. Group of Armenian scientists develop a sensor, business partner comes in, they look at developing. Have you shown this device to 
I don't know, global competitions or symposiums or conferences? Have there been academic articles published about it? Or is that not, are you not at that stage right now? Yes, yes, and yes. And we started actually by showing this internationally. We went out to global security challenge competition, mm -hmm. which is technology comp competition, in 2008. That was our first debut to show the world what we have. And this was shown in uh, competition of Asian countries, mm -hmm. European, country, European and African countries, and America, North, South, and Canada and so forth. Several hundred technologies were competed and our competition was good because we became top two in Asia and top six in the entire world. And we had uh, showings in Singapore and also London and that was our beginning. So internationally we hit the mark and right away business opportunities came forward. Right, I was going to ask, did it create a buzz or did it create interest from different parts? It did. Uh, in Singapore, right away at our first show, uh, there were a couple of uh, partners came in. One of them actually we did business with and we delivered some of these technologies to them. And right now there are several. And last year, actually in 2014 January, we demonstrated this for a variety of companies, the Department of Defense companies in USA, Chantilly, Virginia, and we also had non-DOD companies who are interested to do business with us. Also, we invited the Homeland Security of USA who came and said, if you really do measure this, we want it. So we are trying to go there again and show the, uh, the new fifth generation much more advanced sensors to, uh, to American partners. There are also Germans who are interested. There are also Russians who are interested. They've come and asked us to help them to uh, help solve their problems. We're open to market and open for partnership. Okay, my next, my next logical question is, okay, how do you produce it and where do you produce it and what is the cost of production as a, I mean, if, if, if it's too cost, because I'm sure there's technology that exists in the world that is too costly to produce. Yes. How does this measure? How does this new sensor measure? Very good question. Not all technologies are producible. Some takes time and different technologies to produce them. This technology is uh, simple to produce. It could be produced anywhere. We are producing it now in a low rate production mm -hmm. in Armenia. Uh, why? It's competitive. Armenia has got very high skill level and, and reasonable cost. So we could produce it in Armenia. We could produce it anywhere. We could produce it in America, depending on the rate of production, actually. Mm. The costs are, uh, for low rate production, it's higher than high rate production. This is kind of business when you go into business for protecting borders. There are kilometers, hundreds and thousands of kilometers. So hybrid production will be needed mm -hmm. and we could generate that anywhere. The cost of generating hybrid production of this producible item is not too big, so but it's a, it, there it, is an investment. It's a perfect marriage of science, innovation, production, and marketing. And it's, it's all created by Armenian scientists. They're all created with scientists in America and here. Americans are the business partners. And the, the you, are, you are from the United States. I'm a U.S. citizen, and I started developing this because I knew we could use this in the United States first. And maybe that will be the case as well. We'll see if uh, the government of Armenia will fund us to do the first in Armenia. We'll see. Well, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, Mr. Toros, thank you so much for this fascinating, really fascinating interview. It's, uh, it's always great for us to hear about this kind of technology and innovation that comes from Armenia. So it's very promising and we'll be following the story to see how it ends up or where it ends up. Or maybe we, we, we shouldn't even know where it ends up. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm sure there will be uh, the lots of customers in 2014 and 15 timeframe. Mm -hmm. It's my pleasure to be here and I appreciate your, your interest and that we'll let the world know. We'll let the world know. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I'd like to remind our viewers that my guest today is Armenian-American businessman and technology developer Levon Toros. Stay with Civil Mind.